So Seamus, I hear that Cyberpunk 2077 has actually for real released this week. It's kind of unbelievable, but yeah, it actually came out for real. But then you could make the case that did it really come out or did they just sort of make everybody pay to be alpha testers? Uh... Because, yeah, it's pretty rough. Actually, okay, everybody's talking about the bugs in this game. Irony of ironies, my the bugs I've experienced are actually rare. This is, you know, I'm usually the bug whisperer. I've got problems nobody else has had, everything's horrible for me. The game ran s pretty smoothly for me. Um, the, the most noticeable bug I have is like... Um, a lot of conversations and you know conversations are a big part of this game but people won't move their lips so you'll be talking to somebody and their face will emote but their lips won't move but you kind of get used to I mean you know I remember before I you know I have subtitles on and I remember back in the day there wasn't voice acting so for me this isn't that weird or like uh, what was the what was the game um, that ugh. Terrible with game names right now. The one where where you're uh, J D and, and you, or J C J C Denton and like all those faces were so low res. I don't think their mouths moved either. Oh, they did move a little bit, but it was just so primitive. It was less articulate than you know Kermit the Frog's single hinge mouth. I mean, it was just so ridiculous. Um, yeah. So I was fine with that. The other bug is there's just so many instances that, that, that I saw a lot is people are constantly teleporting around. You know, somebody in the street, you walk up to them and then suddenly they teleport like four feet away. Or you'll go into a room and somebody's <laughs> sitting in a chair and then all of a sudden they're standing up. Wait, they're back in the chair except they're facing the wrong way now. Um, a lot of that. And that's really distracting. But for a lot of people, it was just... I, I've seen the highlight reels on YouTube. And it's just monstrous, just constant crashes and problems. The terrible irony is they had a really, they had like a day one patch, which really helped. And then they had like a day three patch, which was even bigger help. And a lot of people are like, wow, this is so much better. But for me, it made the game worse. Oh, no. You know, the game looked pretty good all the time, but now all trees have this weird... All trees draw on top of the scene. Um, so as I'm driving oh, around, no. like, like, I can see that it's drawn in the correct location, but it, the Z buffer isn't doing it. The depth buffer is not doing its job. So it's in front of everything that's between, you know, the camera and the tree. And it, like it actually, inside your eyeballs? Right. Even worse than that, it flickers in and out of this state. Like, for a few frames, it'll be correct. For a few frames, not. And whether or not it's in, that depends on whether or not the sun's hitting them. So it looks like the trees are flashing. Uh. Now, thankfully, thankfully, this is a, a cyberpunk dystopia. So there are not many trees. This is a not, you know, a green city. But there are some palm trees here and there. And... Boy, when one of them winds up in the scene, it's just this blinking, glowing, shimmering, weird thing in my vision. And it's always, like, bad. It's a Christmas tree. Right. So, this game is big. This game is so big. Um, I played it for five hours. Okay, there's an introduction section, which, you know, you, you pick one of three origin stories, right? You're either... A nomad out in the desert outside of the city or you're a corpo you work in you know a high-rise somewhere and play backstabby politics with other corpos or you're a street kid and you know you come from the streets all three of these origins have their own unique introduction that you play through okay so after that that series no matter what your starting point is you're now on the street basically penniless and your best for and you're you now teamed up with with a guy named Jackie okay so everybody gets eventually funneled into that 
situation, but you have this whole introduction, and they vary wildly in length and the types of content and what goes on in them. Then you team up with him <laughs> for a while. Your, your street kid, your best friend's Jackie, you're already penniless, bam, done. Right. So, and then you get a montage, which is my favorite thing in the game so far. It's just you and Jackie bonding. And it's just this really rapid montage of stupid adventures that you go on to. Fights you get, you know, it shows you shoving somebody in the club, somebody shoves you back, Jackie jumps in, and then it, you know, hard cuts to you at your sink at the end of the day, pulling a tooth out of your head. You're, you know, <laughs> pulling up a tooth that got punched out of your head, right? So that's the kind of montage that it shows you hitting a big score, fat wad of cash, cut to an arms dealer, guns changing hands, cut to Jackie, like, posing ridiculously with two oversized guns. Like, he obviously is a little too excited and a little too irresponsible with these. <laughs> <laughs> like, maybe we shouldn't have brought you two guns, Jackie. But it just, real quick, totally humorous images that tell you the story of the two of you bonding over six months. It's wonderful. And then, and then, at, at this point, you're like 45 minutes into the game and the tutorial begins. What? Yeah, now is the gameplay tutorial. You know, you, you've had all these conversations, you've had all this introduction to the world. I mean, okay, the the intro could have been much shorter if you just click through the dialogue. Yeah, 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 I get it, I don't care. But if you sit and listen to the dialogue and ask all the questions and explore all the environments and pick up all the crap and look around, yeah, you're 45 minutes into the game and the tutorial begins. Is it a skippable tutorial? Um, okay, there's... um. There's the literal tutorial, which is totally skippable. Jackie hands you this sim, you can stick it in your head, and it transports you to VR space where you, like, practice shooting, right? That's totally skippable. But then mm -hmm. this, then the, the, you go on to do a mission, which is kind of a tutorial not for any specific mechanic, but kind of the feel of the game. Okay, we have a goal, there's your quest marker, you know, people talking to you over the radio. It just kind of introduces you to, it's just a very light quest, right? This is the, this is the kind of thing you're going to be doing for the next billion hours. Here's the first one. Very simple, very straightforward, a couple of choices. And to get you familiar, to get you, give you more of a feel for the world. And I think to kind of backfill, like you've been doing jobs with Jackie for six months. This is a typical job. The game is saying this is the kind of thing and it's a really nasty job You know, it just These scavs have kidnapped some they kidnap people off the street Murder them and then just pull all the tech out of their bodies to sell like a chop shop But mm -hmm. instead of cars, right. it's people Okay, and you it ends with like people in the bathtub and you're like sort of sorting through this stack of people in the bathtub trying to figure out who's alive, right? <laughs> but uh, there's gallows wow. humor here and and you know, it's like this isn't this isn't the worst day you and Jackie have had this week, right? Like this is just <laughs> right, right. night city. This is cyberpunk. This is what you the game you signed up for. Exactly. And so that's kind of your tutorial mission. And then after that, you meet more people. You go on long car rides. You get introduced to big shots. You plan a heist. There's a multi-stage thing where you do on, okay, we need a robot to do this. We need to talk to this person for intel. We need to talk to this person to, that gave us the job. Okay, then we have another thing. We ride some limos, have long conversations about what we hope. We're all excited. Big heist coming up this is really going to turn the corner for all of us then you know the heist itself is you know multi stages of skulking around a big fancy hotel doing stuff then okay this can't be it everybody knows if you're a genre aware at all you know this heist is not going to go fine <laughs> like this right. is your it's first like, heist. come on inevitable betrayal where is it Exactly. And this is a cascade of things that don't go according to plan. Your first heist. And 
this cascade of er the wheels coming off and everybody's just trying to hold it together and things go wrong, things you didn't plan for, there's some backstabbing and betray. I don't know if the backstabbing happens at all. Brain Th there's a ton of options, right? It gives you a ton of options for like, do you want to betray this person? Do you want to do this? You can skip this entire quest if you don't like. Here's a person. You should probably talk to them. You don't have to. Endless choices, right? I have no idea mm, how right. how big any of them are. They all felt really major. So you go through the quest. You, so you go through this thing. You s escape from the job by the skin of your teeth. People die. It's all horrible. Things blowing up. And at the end, um, it ends with you getting a bullet in the head. This is five hours into the game. Bullet in the head, slam cut to black, title comes up. Cyberpunk 2077. And you realize, holy cow, I just finished the prologue. <laughs> oh, wow. That's how friggin' big this game is. And then, I, you know what? I just recorded this last night. I want to figure out how big the, the cutscene after the prologue is. 35 minutes. After the prologue, you get 35 minutes of interlude. Um, these are flashbacks, conversations, and cutscenes where you are not playing your character doing the normal video game stuff. And then at the end of those 35 minutes, then it finally t cuts you loose and the game begins proper. You've got the setup, you've got the premise, the pieces are all on the board now. Now you're really playing the game proper. Mm. This is the equivalent of like in Skyrim when you become the dragon, you know, when you suck in your first dragon soul and become the dragonborn or whatever. Like that's, that's, you know, you have now entered the game proper. It's just so staggeringly big. And I think it's too much. Like, I, I don't want to like, oh, I don't like any of this, or this should have been cut down, like, oh, this shouldn't be there, or that shouldn't be there. It's just, if you cut out half the material here, I wouldn't have complained. I wouldn't have felt like anything was missing, right? Yeah. Right, and, you know, keep in mind that prologue is five hours, and that's five hours with a lot of branching in it, right? So there's more than five hours of content there. The yeah, when you get to up to like a 10 course meal, you're like, really? 10 courses? Right. If this had been eight, nobody would have complained that it was incomplete. And what you see with the game is they wanted a huge city. They wanted lots and lots of interactive, you know, they wanted this huge living, breathing city. So now you need massive scope and you need lots and lots of scale you know, all these systems working together. And you want a huge amount of depth, you know, lots and lots, and lots of content, lots and lots of quests, um, lots of gameplay systems, and they wanted an incredibly high level of graphics. They were just, you know, if you imagine this, this series of trade-offs, do we want to go big? Do we want to go glitzy? Do we want to go deep? And they just shoved every slider to the maximum, <laughs> like good, fast, <laughs> cheap, pick any two. And they're like, yes, we want all three, you know, plus, <laughs> plus we want it to be content rich and, you know, cutting edge. And it's just too <sighs> much. I, I would have loved this game if it had come out and had graphics like, you know, Deus Ex, Human Revolution. That would have been fine. Uh, or Grand Theft Auto V. That, that would have been totally fine. That level of graphics still looks incredible. Um, I didn't need... Uh, I appreciate the, the ray trace, or I will once they get the bugs out. But it's just... <laughs> this... It's ironic. This cyberpunk game... Um, you know, Deus Ex Human Revolution was always making all of these Icarus metaphors, like the main character flew too close to the sun, but it wasn't, you know, it. the text never supported that metaphor. Adam Jensen yeah. never, never chose to flee. He never tried to exceed his grasp. He never, like... <laughs> he never he asked never, for this? Is that where you're going? Ex exactly. 
He never asked for it, so nothing he did was the result of hubris. But Cyberpunk 27, 2077 is that metaphor in video game form. They tried to oh. play Clute too close to the sun and ended up falling. It's just too much. It's just too much. I mean, I haven't even... I played through the entire prologue, and then I was like, I need to try that again. And I started a new character with a new origin and went through it again. Um, I hated the original build I made, and I wanted a different one, and I wanted to change my character, and, and I just wanted to see what happened if I made different choices. And, and, and the second time, I kind of tried to hurry a little bit, and yet yeah, still several hours of branching. It's so much. Wow. Well, at least we know um, they weren't just sitting around doing nothing for all those years. Right. They were working very hard. But I think, you know, it's like you alluded to a 10-course meal. Imagine you really like the restaurant, you really love the owner, but they bring you 10 times more food than you can eat. And you're like, <laughs> right. I uh, just, I, what, what do we do? Do we take it home? And uh, like, it's okay. You can serve me less food. I'll come back tomorrow. I'll give you another 60 bucks for another video game as good as this one. <laughs> right? Like, it didn't need to be this friggin' big. If you cut out half the quests in the game, it would still be a very generous game. And you could take that effort and make this one way more polished. And be halfway to making a sequel, <laughs> you know, that will make another 60 bucks from every person on Earth. Um, yeah, yeah, it doesn't seem to make much sense from a from a business perspective, right? Right. I, I talk to young people once in a while and, you know, they, they share, I have an idea for a video game and, it, and they just want, you know, everything. Well, I want the game to have the best of everything, and it'll just be the best graphics and the most content and the most characters and the best of everything, right? Like, that's that's your idea is everything. And right, right. It's totally understandable. It's like the but... mall ninja gun of video games. <laughs> right. And... That's totally understandable. But, like, you usually... People that think like that don't end up in charge of projects where you actually have to produce a video game. Right. And one has to imagine that, like, that's not what they said. Like, that, that can't have been the design document, right? Put it all in. Hang on. I want to move on and I want to talk about the, the, the review restrictions. Mm. Um, you know, I've, for years I've had this attitude like cyber or, CD Projekt Red are the good guys. They are the developers that really care about people and care about the hobby. And I got to say, this game really shook that for me. Um, you know, I like this company. They had, you know, no DRM bullshit. Their, their store isn't filled with crap to just constantly get you to manipulate, to manipulate you into buying things, right? Yeah, they're trying to offer the best selection that they can. And also games that they think fit well with the other games that they have on offer. Like your typical grocery store has all these psychological manipulations to try and get you to buy things that you didn't mean to buy. Right? <laughs> Placement right. of items, end caps, positioning of things, putting foods that have, you know, they'll cook foods in the store to try and make you hungry just before you pass by other things. Right, like there's all this stuff going on to try and manipulate you into spending more money than you intended. Or you like go to a garage sale, a garage sale or like a farmer's market, and they've just got the crap just out. Hey, you want to buy some of our crap? And I always yeah. felt like CD Projekt Red was the latter, right? They weren't trying to be this big manipulative thing. They just... We love games. We want to make games and we want you to buy. We hope you'll buy them. Right. Here's a table full of games. If you want one, great. And that's how they felt for years. But then this game, of all games, they... Um, <laughs> oh, the irony. Right. This one, they like said, all right, for your day one, you know, 
we give everybody the game on, I don't know, Monday, Tuesday, when it doesn't come out until Thursday. So you've got the game, and you can review it. But if you put up a review, you are not allowed to use any of the footage from the game. You have to use our promotional footage from any of our trailers. Hmm. And it's obvious this was to hide the bugs, because otherwise, every single review would have been a bug highlight re reel of just teleporting characters, floating guns, physics glitches, nonsense explosions, um, <laughs> you know. Sounds like free oh, publicity it, to me. Right, but the, and they didn't want that. They didn't want the public to know how broken the game was. So you had all these reviewers like really frustrated like I wish I could show you all this footage and and once the game was out everybody immediately you know uh, released their footage but that's that's a super skeevy thing to do oh we don't want you to show people the product <laughs> that you're reviewing you will give yeah. you a review copy as long as you promise to not tell everybody how bad it is and that was a huge red flag like wow the cyberpunk or the CD Projekt Red of five years ago would not have done that. Or my perception of who they were as a company and people. Yeah, yeah. And it's always hard to tell if it's like just the developer, or just like one marketing guy that's in charge of it, or if it's the whole culture shifting, or if it was always that way. Like you said, maybe it was always that way and you just didn't notice. Right. So that was really, that was just really frustrating to see. And I did not like that. And that kind of shook my perception of the entire company. Like now I'm like more wary of everything they say and do because this is a very buggy game. Well, they're angling to be the new Bethesda, I guess. Right. Well, the difference is, I mean, they are, they already have done two massive patches and everybody's assuming that they'll do more, just like they did for Witcher. They kept balancing and changing the Witcher. The Witcher, several months after release, was and the witcher i'm talking about witcher 3 wild hunt was mm. great at release and even better six months later like it went from incredible to ultra incredible and now it's <laughs> cyberpunk 2077 everybody's assuming that it's going to go from janky as hell to acceptable or maybe even great right well and and like if the if the patches uh, can be applied in such a way that they fix problems across the whole game, then it's just going to amplify the the focus on the content, right? Like the amount of content right. that's available to you that isn't janky is just going to keep going up. Right. It's a great game. I love playing. I mean, that's all I've done for several days. I didn't check the blog almost all day. I think it was Friday. Just, you know, woke up, played the game all day. And went back to sleep. I think I left a couple of comments, <laughs> but I was definitely AWOL for a long time on the site because I was just engrossed in this video game. And I'm like, geez, I haven't done this in years. Uh, so it is a very engrossing game. It's just, it's just weird. It's bigger than it needed to be. And that bigness, that, that ambition is, I think, what hurt the game. You know, did you need to make the most content with the most systems, with the most stuff, at the most cutting-edge graphics? No. No, you didn't. You could easily have sacrificed any one of those and people would still love you. And it would have made the final product so much better. And there would have been just less chaos and crunch. I think one of the problems was... Uh, th I have nothing to support this. I've read nothing in the media. But I suspect they were targeting PS4 hardware. And when the PlayStation 5 was announced, they decided, hey, let's just port the game to the, you know, we'll also put out the game on the new Oh, board. sure. Yeah. And Upgrade and the now architecture to take advantage of the new hardware. And then that means changes to the engine, and that means changes to everything. Exactly. And I think... I think that's the, they had a big delay, like a year long delay. And I'll bet you that's what that decision pushed them back from like March of 2020 to the end of this year. And then that cascade of further delays after that was them just trying to get that under control. They should have just, hey, the game's 
going to come out in 2021. Just summer 2021 or whatever. March 2021. Whatever. Just take your time. Finish the friggin' game. Um, it was... That's Unless they couldn't have killed. afforded it. Right. That I suppose if they were running out of money. I, I did read that they... This is one of the... This is the biggest single player game ever, basically. Um, mm. On Steam, they track numbers for most simultaneous users of a game. Like multiplayer games oh, sure, normally. Sure. Yeah. Simultaneous players, the previous top one was 400,000 for Fallout 4, right? At one time, 400,000 people were all playing Fallout 4 on Steam. Now, the, the multiplayer games blow that out of the water. Like uh, PUBG, I think, was like 3 million at its peak. Right. But this game had a million concurrent players. <sighs> wow. Yeah, so more than doubled the previous record. They have already recouped their development costs, which, you know, they spent eight years on this freaking game, and they made it all back in one day. <sighs> wow. That's including right, so, pre-orders, though, right? Yes. So you think if you could have just waited five more months, got the bugs ironed out, you could have had all of that glory, plus you wouldn't have all of this controversy. And you wouldn't have I had guess. all that crunch. I don't know. Yeah. I, like, it seems like if they made their money back already, and it's just going to keep getting better from here, maybe it worked. Right, and that's my worry. Maybe they'll just like, well, it's okay to release a horribly buggy game as long as you fix it later. And that takes you down the Bethesda route where it's like, hey, we release one and people will <laughs> love it even if we don't fix it later. Or even if it takes us a long time to fix it. Or even if we don't fix it. Or if we just put in modding tools and let them fix it. <laughs> like, <in laughs> right, the, right. <laughs> that, that takes you, that's, that's We're rewarding the them for the wrong kind of behavior. It's a bad right. attitude. That's that's Todd Howard behavior. That's the dark side. So, um, those are my thoughts on Cyberpunk 2077. I have a lot more I could say about it, but I, I feel like I've ate up half the show talking about it. So let's talk about something else. What did you do with yourself this week, Paul? Uh, well, I mostly played Mindustry. Uh, I mentioned last week that Mindustry had a big update and um, Creeper World 4 came out. I guess it was, was it the way last week or the week before? Anyway, um, Creeper World 4 is basically just like Creeper World 3 plus plus. So it's good. Uh, but my industry has like, it's turned a page and it's, it's pretty sweet. The, the thing that they changed is that the, the whole planet has, so all the, all the missions are running at the same time. So when you capture a zone, it just keeps running, accumulating resources. And then near the late game, you unlock the launch pad, which allows you to send resources from one map to another map. And so now there's incentive to like upgrade all your manufacturing on all of your levels in order to produce as much material or material as possible to send it to the mission that you're actually trying to beat so that then you don't have to mine anything on that mission. You just build stuff on that mission. And then once you capture it, then you convert everything into manufacturing. And so it's this this crazy thing. And then there are like counterattacks where they'll, some of the zones you've captured will get attacked again. And so you don't want to take all of your defenses down. So there's a balance. It's it's a fascinating is a fascinating thing. It's, uh, so I've been having a lot of fun with it. Cool. I have not gotten I'm back to it. Not gonna. It's not gonna compete with Cyberpunk 2077. But uh, I was just about to say I haven't gotten back to it. Um, I was playing something else this week. I don't remember what. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and there's not a whole lot of chance that I'm going to end up playing Cyberpunk 2077 just because I've got kids watching me all the time. And that wouldn't work too well. But, uh, so yeah. So if, uh, if for whatever reason Cyberpunk 2077 isn't uh, rocking your boat or whatever the analogy is these days, uh, check out my history. Cool. So, Paul, have you ever heard of the movie Molly's Game? No. Should I have? Well, I hadn't either. But it's a big movie with, like, famous movie stars in it. Okay, here's the thing. I watched this movie and it blew me away. Like, a, a bunch of new stuff popped up on Netflix. 
and I was like, oh, okay, I'll watch all the new stuff. And I watched this movie, and then I immediately chose not to watch anything else. I didn't want to shove this movie <laughs> out of my brain with just the next, you know, batch of car chases and explosions. So Molly's Game is based on a true story. And this is another script by Aaron Sorkin. Now, I'm not... Here's the thing with Aaron Sorkin. I hate him, and I, but I love his work. Or maybe I <laughs> love him and I hate his work. I don't know. There is a complex relationship between Aaron Sorkin and I. He does a lot of based on a true story um, kind of stuff. He did um, hmm. recently Trial of the Chicago 7. He did The Social Network. Um... So this is his thing, is he takes a true story and makes it into a movie. Punches he, it up into a script. He, yes, and he does a lot of punching it up. Like, he is not afraid to bruise the truth in the name of making things witty and well-paced. And This is the street fighter of punch-ups. Right. <laughs> He's not afraid to bend the truth in the name of a story. And sometimes you can hear him, like he often has a point he wants to make, political or social, he just, he has an ax to grind. And when you get to that scene in the movie, you can hear Aaron <laughs> Sorkin, you know, using the characters like Muppets to, to right. speak through He's got them. his hand up both of them and they're both talking, yep. but to the camera. Right. You can catch him doing that a lot. And that's that's normally, like, if anybody else tries that, I will say, no, that's horrible, that's obnoxious, shame on you, that is bad story, you're breaking so many rules of storytelling, and yeah, you're making yeah. your no story less... no one likes to less... be preached to in, a, in entertainment. Right. And you make the story so much less true, and therefore less useful, and less interesting. But I don't know, something about his style of to storytelling he gets me to overlook that or forget it. And so I end up loving his movies, even though, you know, I I think he has done the truth a disservice many times. But mm. boy, okay, so Molly's Game. Oh, the punchline is this is a new movie that I was all excited about. It's not a new movie. This came out in 2017. It's got major stars in it, and somehow I never heard of it. An Aaron Sorkin movie came out three years ago with a lot of people I find interesting involved in the project, and I had no idea. So the, the story is, this is a true story, Molly was an Olympic skier. Um, she had back problems when she was young, had this major spinal... What do you call that when your spine isn't straight? Mm, I don't remember. I, I don't remember either. It's super common. Anyway, her spine was crooked growing up, really crooked. Did this major surgery. They said, all right, you know, you're going to be fine. But, you know... No impact, you know, no gymnastics, nothing like that, you know, just, and she became a skier anyway. Yeah. <laughs> she became a skier of all things, you know, the high speed, like, um, where they're just going over the bumps. I forget what that, those are called. The, moguls. Yeah. Yeah. Moguls. Where you just go over those at insane speeds, like the one thing you should never freaking do if you've got a dodgy spine. <laughs> Um, so that was going to be her life, and she was an Olympic contender. Then, uh, in a just a random freak thing, some some bit of uh, debris on the on the slope jammed into her ski and released the latch on it during her one of her qualifying runs. So she lost oh, the no. ski just as she went off a jump, lost control, basically landed on her neck. <laughs> Um, ended her career right there. So then, randomly, she moves to L.A., and I forget what her original plan was, but she had some plan of something she was going to do in L.A., but she ended up working for this toxic asshole who had her running a poker game. 
like he wants to play high stakes poker with his buddies and he has her like calling everybody keeping it organized ordering the food organizing the music getting the dealers and he just you know she was his personal assistant and he just treated her like shit but she learned how to run a poker game ah. and when he got too abusive she just one week called everybody and said yeah we're having it um somewhere else this week and she just <laughs> took the entire game with her and this i should add this is a game full of movie stars this is everybody at the, not everybody at this table well yeah everybody at this table is somebody they're famous they're powerful they're important um some of them are big Silicon Valley types. Some of them are movie stars. Other, than, other of them are Hollywood producers. This is a game for big, powerful people. She's got billionaires at her table. And she actually rented a hotel room. She'd like saved up like a, you know, $30,000 just in tips, right? From running this oh, game. You wow. Know, as people left, they'd give her a thousand bucks, you know? Right, right. And she, she did that for a year or whatever, saved up $30,000 and then sank it all into starting up this game. She built her own tables, got this fancy, so wonderful hotel. So she made a more upscale version of that same game, right? So they all came and they were like, oh, this we're no longer doing this in somebody's basement. This is a really nice venue. And she kept doing that and got more and more upscale and was running this amazing game. And I don't want to spoil any more of the story, but it was basically, you know, at, you know, at 18, she was going to the Olympics and by 25, she was running poker games for movie stars where like a single hand wow. was, was a single hand would be this price of a house. Okay. Every hand is the price of a house. Right. Absolutely crazy. And she had more investigations. And of course, the government doesn't like gambling. And so she wound up arrested and they weren't really after her. They were after other people. And it just like the wheels came off in the most unbelievable way. And I actually thought Aaron Sorkin was just going crazy with the truth, had just like totally bent this. And then I realized, no, most of this is pretty much true he definitely condensed things to make it you know a better story but yeah this ridiculously improbable story is true so amazing it, this this movie is, st is still with me i still take it out and think about it and think about the different i just love this movie so much and i wanted to like talk about people hey this new movie came out and i realized it was three years old the conversation is over <laughs> long over long over i feel like hey guys did you hear about that all your base meme isn't it funny <laughs> so well, maybe it's any, uh, maybe you're just maybe you're you're early to it coming back who knows if anybody else has any thoughts on the movie good or bad if you dug it throw some comments in there i kind of wanted other people to talk about the movie let's do some mailbags Dear Diecast, Seamus, I read an article in The Guardian that reminded me of you. It turns out that you are not a lone weirdo for inventing, inverting your mouse. There's a, quote, large minority, unquote, who do so, and scientists are starting to study the differences between the inverters and the non-inverters. To test my completely unfounded hypothesis, on a mouse or joystick, do you parse down as back, like tilting your head back to look up? I hope that this research will erase awareness and finally get the satisfactory devs to make a y-axis inversion that actually works in vehicles link to the article the guardian best regards rfs 81 ps they do not say anything about using the numpad instead of west thank you for the question rfs 81 you know what this is an esoteric thing i don't think anybody you know what let's skip this let's skip this one Th this is too esoteric nobody wants to hear about inverted controls i'll just do the next m email dear casters of the die an IFLS article just came up in my social media feed about scientists studying why some people prefer inverted controls. Okay, fine, we'll do it. <sighs> Thank you for the question, Randy. All right, so 
yeah, I'm a control inverter. But here's the thing that bothers me about the conversation. People get so um, arrogant about their position here. Everybody's like, the other way of doing this is just stupid. Let me explain. No, my way is obviously the only proper way to think of it. And to me, it's like, you know, driving on the left side or the right side of the road. It seems incredibly weird, uncomfortable, and counterintuitive if it's not being done the way you think it should be done. But ultimately, in a cognitive sense, your brain does not care. It only wants to do whichever it was introduced to first. And then people... So wh what happens is people find one of these ways. They find a mental model. They latch on to... Or, no, they don't find a mental model. They just do whatever makes sense to them. And then after they get attached to it, then they start building up this whole justification system after the fact. The first email here um, refers to the, the mental model that people use. Like, if you invert your controls, then you could picture it as being a joystick on top of somebody's head. If you push the joystick forward, then they're going to, their head will go forward and they will be looking down. And if you pull the stick towards yourself, then you'll pull their head up and they'll be looking up, right? And that's what's known as inverted Y. Right. And so some people explain it that way. And then other people are like, no, if you think of the joystick is like coming out of your nose. Or no, what if it's in the back of your head? And I'm like, that is not how anybody made their decision, right? <laughs> They're like, what <laughs> mental model am I going to use for this new control scheme? They... I always thought of it as like the mouse, if you imagine the mouse, like picking it up and putting the bottom of the mouse on the screen and then like pushing in the direction that you want to turn. And so, sure. like, and that's non-inverted Y. Right. And people approach it that way and they're obviously like, they're, how do I want to say this? Yes, they're using a model like that. Like the one you just said, Paul, or the one that I said earlier, but they don't, think about the model first. They just do whatever comes naturally to me or, or to them, whatever. And then later they come up with all these justifications talking about joysticks in different positions. Um, right. Like, and usually it's like a game that doesn't have an option to invert Y and they, that's just the first one that they played or it's got a default to something and they just right. played that. And so they learned it. It's not like they decided what was going to be best. They just interacted with something that had that as the standard. Exactly. And that seems to be what it's true for a lot of people. Like, there are all sorts of interesting things you could analyze about this. In a, in a first-person game, it's pretty clear that when you press right, you want to turn your head to the right. But in a third-person game, you're controlling the camera. There's a camera floating outside of your player. You're like a cameraman suspended in space. If you press right to look right, that means the camera is moving to the left and orbiting the person. <laughs> yes. So no matter what model you come, come up with, there is an equally valid mental model that can counter it. So what we have is this um, chaos machine where you can go left or right up or down you know everybody hits it chooses one at first and then decides that that's the correct way and everybody should have gone that way and some people switch back and forth if they're in a flying game they'll use inverted controls but if it's a first person game they won't some people use inverted on a on a game controller but not mouse and keyboard or vice versa like uh, some people want inverted when they're in a vehicle, but not on foot or vice versa. Again, if you imagine a, pa a pachinko machine with all the balls bouncing randomly off of each peg and they eventually land in one slot, this slot is, this particular slot is why inverted in flying games, but not in first person games, 
but only with using mouse and keyboard and not with a controller. Like that's the slot somebody lands in. And then they will immediately try to explain in everybody else to everybody else in all the other slots why everybody else is an idiot and this is the only correct slot for anybody to land in. Or or they would on anyone else's site, but you're not allowed to do that on your site. So nobody does. Which is great. <laughs> right. Right. But I, I think it's an interesting thing. It just drives me crazy when people just sort of like, well, of course, my way is obviously the only correct way to think of it. And that's sort of like, I don't even want to argue with the person. I just want to mute them. Like, okay, that is such a stupid statement. Like, again, a bunch of piles of pachinko balls, every one of them thinking that it landed in the correct random slot. <laughs> All and other the links options to these about. two articles are perfect because they're the ones on the Guardian and ones by ILFS or IFLS. And the the short link on on the Guardian is scientists are studying why gamers why some gamers invert their controls, and the IFLS one is scientists are finally studying why some of you nerds don't invert your controls. <laughs> didn't even notice that. That's brilliant. That is amazing. I love it. I think I did an informal poll on my site, and I forget, like, what percentage. I think it's, like, around 20% of it. Like, about one in five of us invert. And it's so, almost always Y invert, although some people also invert yeah. X. Right. I remember good, Beyond Good and Evil for me was just a horrible experience because if you inverted Y, it also inverted X. So we <laughs> always had... It, what? What? Yeah, so I could have Y the way I wanted it, but then left and right would be backwards. And so always some part of the game had to be backwards for me. That was bad enough, but then there were parts in the game where you would get confused by an enemy and it would make that confusion took the form of it reversing the controls on you <laughs> um i actually did not beat the final boss i saw the final boss was an invert of all the controls that i'd come to hate and i'm like okay i get it i i don't want to do that i am so tired of constantly pressing the buttons backwards i and i just went and watched it on youtube because, oh, that was, uh. that's one of the most uncomfortable games I've ever played. And I actually, that's kind of where I decided to lay down the law and say, I'm not going to play a game that doesn't let me. Because after I played that game, I went and played a few other, you know, I'd go on to another game and I realized, holy cow, that now I'm doing everything backwards. Like, not only did I not enjoy yeah. that game, <clears throat> but it ruined my ability to enjoy other games. <laughs> so I said, never do that again. I know on Kerbal Space Program, the they had the ability to independently invert X or Y, and, and that's great. But then they also had like a bunch of other options for like whether you invert controls in vehicle mode and in docking mode, and there were all these different things. And I remember that I would always get confused when I because I wanted the I would navigate a lot by the nav ball, and so you press like up to move the cursor up on the nav ball but then you press left to move the ball itself left yes. and so then i would invert that but then when i was flying an airplane i would be trying to do it like a joystick and then that would be inverted and so then i'd be like diving to the ground when i'm trying to take off and it was like uh the, there wasn't quite enough granularity there i had the exact same problem in kerbal space program the presence of the nav ball flipped how I wanted to use one of my axes. Like, if the nav ball yeah. hadn't been there, I would have just wanted to treat it like a plane. But because I was navigating on the surface of a ball, I wanted to treat it different. And I remember I had... Because you really, especially launching a rocket, you really watch the nav ball more than you watch your rocket. Yeah, it really was a, a nav ball kind of situation is kind of a weird thing right they've got all this like the rocket and all the pieces and stuff but you don't care about any of that all you care about is your azimuth and, and latitude right. controls and stuff right because you can't tell hey my rocket you know you can't tell by looking at it the rocket is you know five degrees off from your intended path but you can tell by looking at the nav ball and when you're 
doing orbital maneuvers, five degrees is a pretty big deal. You don't want to be off by five degrees, because off by five degrees on this end means off by millions of miles on the other end. <laughs> right? Yeah, or, or like doing rendezvous. Like, you want to be able to track that thing really well, because you're trying to match velocity, and you've only got so much fuel, and... Uh, yeah, you don't want to have to be hunting around for like, oh, where am I going exactly? And where is it approaching me or not? Or is it going away from me? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, on top of that, like orbital maneuvers are already suffer from a terrible case of, wait, why is it getting farther from me? I'm moving towards it. I can't figure this out. <laughs> yeah. Orbital, orbital maneuvers really do require you to like think of things very differently. Like, this is apparent. I watched one of Scott Manley's videos, and he talked about how experienced astronauts were getting this wrong. Because mm. your intuition is just so bad. Yeah, we, we have no embodied knowledge of how to do orbital mechanics, because nothing in our biological history has required that of us in any way, shape, or form. Right. The model I use, speaking of mental models, the, the model I use is um picture or like marbles zooming around on the inside of a ball that we can't uh, on the inside of like a bowl or something and obviously you go faster and you will go higher up towards the lip away from the center yeah so if you gun it going towards the other marble in front of you you are obviously going to be pushed higher and that gives me enough knowledge that i don't make super boneheaded like I don't do the stupid thing of just thrusting towards my target at max speed and then wondering why <laughs> it keeps like a long haul trucker me. you're just like I'm gonna point right. toward it, I'm gonna push the pedal down right exactly you it avoids that mistake but I still end up staring at it going wait um okay I know what not to do but I don't know what to do <laughs> it, it saves me from the naive problem, but it doesn't help me know what the correct answer is. Uh, Kerbal Space Program. That's another game that was delayed this year. What happened to Kerbal Space Program 2? Uh, if you remember earlier this year, the publisher took it away from the developers working on it and gave it to another developer, which was actually the same people, but the, basically the... Publishers oh, right. torpedoed. They, yeah, they torpedoed the original studio, created their own, and then hired as many people as they could from the one they just killed. <laughs> I see you're uh, hanging out in the lifeboat there. I bet you'd like someone to pick you up out of the water. Right. Um, we're not going to stop firing torpedoes at it, by the way. <laughs> 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 well, th those are coming. In fact, we've got more in the water, so you might want to jump into our lifeboat. So I am anticipating that game to be very late, and... Well, I believe the developers have their heart in the right... These aren't even the original developers of the first game. These people are already like, well, I don't know if they can make a good Kerbal game. There's very particular needs that the audience respect, expects. But now, not only are we not sure these people can do it, but we're not even sure if the leadership would let them do it. For all we know, this leadership might be like, oh, this game definitely needs to be more arcadey. All the bug reports from the publisher are like, I tried thrusting towards my target and I got further away. Fix it. <laughs> <laughs> the orbital mechanics in this game are wrong. Also the yes, physics. They are wrong. <laughs> yes, so correct them so that they are right. So that when you thrust towards something and you're both in orbit and you thrust to it as fast as you can, you reach it. Also, where are the brakes? I can't find the brakes. Add orbital parking brake. I turned, I turned, I was flying around in space and I turned my spaceship to the left and I did not begin moving left. Instead, I was flying sideways. This is obviously a bug. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I hope not. Uh, I, I sincerely hope not. Me too. Me too. I, I, fingers crossed for that team and everybody involved. I hope they're doing okay. Um, and I hope they're able to make the game properly, but wow, I just don't necessarily hope, I don't necessarily know that team is up for it, and I really suspect the leadership is motivated by 
bad mode <laughs> is not thinking about well how can we make the best Kerbal Space Program game. I don't think that's where their heart is at. Mm. Do you have time for one more mailbag? Let's do one more mailbag. Hi! As you probably heard, the release of Cyberpunk 2077, oh yeah, we did hear about that, was less than ideal. Also that the game was, and still is, very buggy and nearly unplayable on older consoles. Given how much hype surrounded this title, do you think it may lead to some kind of change in the industry? One that will force publishers to release more polished games? No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Oh wait, I'm sorry, you didn't finish the question. I'm sorry. It's not I'm not I'm quite sorry. done yet. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Especially gonna, since I mean, titles like Fallout 76 or Anthem were stuck with similar problems? There's probably a lot of reasons why it won't happen, and I'm just curious about your opinion. Cheers, Derek. Okay, Seamus, take it away. Yeah, I think they are going to have a change of heart, and uh, we probably won't get any mo more buggy games from now on. I think they've right, learned Well, thanks lesson. everybody for listening to the DieCast. If you have any questions for Seamus... Uh, you can I don't bother sending him in because he's not gonna answer them because this hobby sucks I'm I'm now I'm in fact right now googling what it takes to get into knitting Because I'm leaving this hobby. I'm gonna become a knitter or whatever you call people that do knitting stuff Yeah, yeah, you got it right you got it in one. All right knitsman to answer this you could you become a, a knitsman, <laughs> knitsman. <laughs> So uh if Fallout 76 didn't teach them that lesson then certainly not the. I mean, what lesson is this teaching the publishers? Release one of the buggiest games in recent memory, and you will smash um, sales records. Make your money back in one day, <laughs> and hit an all-time high. Like, no, this is they've learned. If they learn any lessons from this, it will be the wrong ones. I'm, that's another reason I'm kind of pissed off that CD Projekt Red decided to do this. Like, with four more months or whatever. Like, look at how much they fixed in the few weeks since they went. They probably went gold like six weeks or two months ago. And since then, they've made massive improvements to the quality of the game. Like, the the game that reviewers got was Oh, very, without the day one patch. Without the day one patch was barely playable crashed every 15 minutes then with the day one patch it was playable but ugly distracting and janky as hell with the latest patch it's vastly improved again you know like people are reporting oh it runs 10 frames a second faster <laughs> and this is just like those couple of months were all that was needed to get this huge you know two more months would have been another entire enormous step forward for this game so although yeah. it seems like part of because they do this they have done this in the past with their other titles where they release a game it's not quite right and then they fix it uh and it seems like they've got to have a lot of instrumentation going on for like what kind of things people are actually running into so that they can focus their efforts which despite right. i'm sure the extensive testing they do has got to be better than testing in-house yeah and you know what i would forgive that little bit of like in fact, I'd be totally okay with that if they released the game and they and they discovered after the fact, oh, people that are on this particular AMD card and this particular processing processor configuration have this weird problem and, oh, it's really bad for those folks. And I would just, you know, and they come out with a patch a week later. Sorry, sorry. You know, I, I understand obscure problems like that are hard to or really weird technological things that are hard to sort out just because I know what a nightmare it is to solve problems like that and how impossible it is to test every possible combination of hardware. And, you know, the cost of doing that just goes up exponentially. So I'm totally willing to like accept, all right, you know, you didn't get it perfect, but you really would. But like <laughs> this, the, it was that's so not what happened here point. right this wasn't obscure bugs that was like or obvious bugs but that only affected certain people this was like across the board everybody has this bug what are you doing <laughs> um also the the game is was basically unplayable on the two last-gen consoles, Xbox One and PS4. The game was just an absolute disaster, runs terribly, looks awful, 
again, this comes back to my point where I think they should have just... Like, I think that was their original target platform. I think they should have just kept that, their target platform. And then all of us PC users would have just inherited, hey, that game runs like a dream on my system. You know, because what the... the Current, the PS4 generation is like 2013 technology, I think. And then on the new consoles, also, it would presumably be very performant. Right. And they could come out with a... A year from now, they could come out with the Super Edition that has, you know... I know they wouldn't want to do... Okay, here's the thing. They wouldn't want to sell the game a second time. Oh, that would be wrong. That would be immoral for us to sell the game a second time, you know, with just you know, ray tracing turned on and all these extra graphical bonuses that the next gen affords. Sure. Quadruple it, the texture size and whatever else. Right. Okay. I can respect that. But doing that would be better than what you did. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it would, it would be immoral to sell a, an upgrade to our product that was low quality to begin with. So instead we'll just only give you the low quality option, but also right. it runs poorly on the low quality machines. Right. It's just the worst of all. Everybody loses. And it's just, I thought this was behind us. Just the chasing graphical fidelity. Chasing graphical fidelity was just poison for years. And then, you know, we kind of got over that. But, you know, this, I guess this happens at the, at the seams. Every time we hit a new console generation, we get a few games that have this problem. They try to straddle generations and they just fly apart. It's just stupid that Cyberpunk was one of them. They should have just kept it for the PS4 gen. I would have loved it. I would not have complained about the graphics. Yeah, yeah. And then and then they could release like corporate shill edition and then it's got like the ray tracing or whatever. They could just and play into it, right? Right. And I would have been happy to buy another remastered Ultimate Super Edition of your... I mean, I wanted to buy a collector's edition of this game. It's the first time I've ever wanted that. I was so excited for this game. I was like, you know what? I'm willing to pay like 90 bucks for this. You know, and I like, is there a special edition that like comes with the soundtrack and like a bunch of cool extra stuff? And there wasn't. Like, I couldn't do that. <laughs> All these other games are constantly trying to get me to do that. And I'm like, hell no. I barely want to give you 60. <laughs> this game, I was willing to pay more, but they didn't give me the option. I'm like, I would have bought this twice. I would have bought the PS4 version this year. And then, you know, two years down the road, the, the souped up version, I would have bought that too. Right. Can I get like V's glowy collar as like a plastic add-on or something? Right. Right. Well, I think we've done a show. Somehow made it happen. Two weeks in a row. This crazy town. Right? Seamus, so. the world really is better. Cyberpunk 2077 is out. Is it better, though? <laughs> is it really better? Well, thanks to everybody who sent in questions. If you've got a question for the show, the email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. We've actually got some questions left over that we didn't get to this week. Hopefully we'll get to them next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye, Paul.
I got to do the I'm sorry, Dave, I can't do that line at some point. Do you want me to change my name to Dave to make it work better? There we go. We'll just, oh, oh, here we go. We'll just do like one episode where I just call you Dave the whole time instead of Seamus. And it'll, we'll set it up.